Hey there, brain hackers. Ever wonder why legal fees are so incredibly expensive? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of a brain hack that is a different way to look at the world and understanding the history of this that is actually going to reveal why legal fees are so expensive on purpose. There's a conspiracy behind it, yes. And I'm actually talking uh, with Alan uh, Mendenhall. He is the Associate Dean at uh, Good Jones School of Law, Executive Director of Blackstone and uh, Burke Center for Law and Liberty and editor of the Southern, Southern Literary Review. He also is promoting his uh, recent book, Writers on Writing. Uh, this guy knows about the law and he's also done a lot of interviews with other people just like me. So it's gonna be a great discussion after this. And you're gonna find the secret uh, of why legal fees are so expensive in this country and how that can actually be changed hopefully someday, right after this. Hey, Alan, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me. All right, so you introduced me. So first of all, I want to say Writers on Writing is a great anthology. You have been doing kind of what I've been doing where you've interviewed a whole lot of people and now you've made an anthology about it. So I want to, you know, if people are interested in that and interested in some of the things that I do here, it's very similar. So I would encourage them to look you up and get that anthology. But after we were talking, you, you, you made me aware of of something that is really, really mind blowing. That is that the reason why legal fees in this country are so goddamn high is on purpose. There's actually, I would say it's conspiracy uh, to, to keep them high, right? So, so explain that, explain the history behind it. Well, I don't know if I would call it a conspiracy, but there's definitely a design to be uh, instituting anti-competitive practices. So uh, in the- Sounds like a conspiracy frame... to me, but, but continue on. <laughs> well, Late 19th, early 20th century, you had a lot of new entrepreneurial types trying to uh, break into the legal field. So ethnic minorities, uh, people from lower classes, and they were doing things like advertising, you know, the horrors, the horrors. And uh, the established lawyers thought that these were unseemly practices and that they didn't like competition. They didn't like having more lawyers because that would drive costs down if you just had, you know, a multitude of lawyers out there. So they, well, and they also, from what I hear, they didn't like uh, other people offering legal services. You know, where you start to exactly. specialize in in one area of law or another. And I actually, I, if I if my memory serves, uh, Abraham Lincoln actually advertised, and that was very controversial because a lot of lawyers thought that was not something you should be doing. It, it was uh, you know lowbrow, so to speak. Well, and Lincoln is an interesting example because one barrier to entry that he did not have to deal with was the bar exam. He was pre-bar exam. He'd interviewed before a judge, and that was sort of the common way to get in. That was how you, you would do an interview with the judge, and if you were deemed competent, there you were. You could practice, and apprenticeship was the model before, uh, before the bar exams. But all these barriers to entry, bar exams, having to go to law school before bar exams, uh, having to be admitted to a bar association, the creation of the American Bar Association, all these things were designed as barriers to entry so that practicing and established lawyers at the time could ensure that they monopolized the legal industry and could keep their fees high. And, uh, and so they instituted anti-competitive practices that just drove up fees. And of course, now you've got the high cost of legal education and all these things that are expensive before you can even practice law. So you've got young people who enter the profession with all this debt and all these costs associated with law get passed off on consumers. And the, uh, the prices of legal services are sort of artificially inflated. They're artificially high. Now, now that, that is, uh, obviously people want to have some sort of quality. People would argue that you want to, you know, you, you want to be represented by somebody who is competent. But the way you're telling me is that the, the, the reason for the association was financial. People, uh, lawyers were, were for the wealthy and of the wealthy and only of the wealthy. And there was this whole majority of people that were very poor that never had access to the law and when they started rising up financially when they started to become what we would consider a middle class then there were then you know the legal profession was starting to spread out and this was really an attempt to stop that it was basically a, a, a willful attempt at elitism and it wasn't really about quality it was about protecting your your border and keeping the rich safe essentially yeah. and them, you protecting know, a guild i mean the legal profession is probably the oldest surviving medieval guild and that is what it is it that's is that's true yeah 
Yeah, and and actually, some of those uh, during the creation of the, of, of the guild, some of that was not just financial, but some of it was racially motivated. I mean, the American Bar Association early on admitted some African Americans by a- accident. They didn't realize that they had admitted to African Americans, and then when they discovered it, they actually ousted them from membership. So uh, there was an element of of race and not just class to this. Uh, to these well, barriers. like you also say, you know, immigrants as well. We have uh, immigrants as well. Yep. Hispanic exactly. descent, and I think people wanted to be uh, to be represented. Yeah, there was also a large growing class of, of people of color who were starting to make real money, and there was this Correct. desire to keep, uh, you know, to keep this class system. The law is supposed to be the great equalizer, and when you create the whole point of equality is equality under the law. And when you create a, a two-tier legal system, which was what, what was created by the American Bar Association, uh, you know, you're 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 essentially setting up all of society for that for that uh, that problem. Now we have lawyers who are incredibly expensive and skilled, you know, and then uh, I guess to compensate later on, they created kind of the pro bono or public defender. But of course, there's all sorts of jokes and you know concerns about that sort of equality, uh, what would you say would have been the solution if you were to re- rewind time instead of the ABA, just allow competition and then we wouldn't have this huge tier system? Well, I think that's part of it. And I think one way to uh, enable competition would be with the example of the American Bar Association, which drives up costs of, of legal education in particular, is to decentralize that and leave it to the state Supreme Court's and uh, state legislatures to determine what criteria uh, would um, would make someone eligible for admission into the bar. I mean, that's already at some level how it exists, but uh, in, in order to uh, sit for a bar exam in most states, you have to graduate from an ABA accredited law school. And to be an ABA accredited law school, you have to comply with all the ABA standards. And a lot of them are archaic, uh, they they uh, fix the number of credit hours to graduate, so you have to take three years of law school when really mm-hmm. a lot of the core classes you could finish in a year and a half. Are, they limit the amount of online education you can do. Um, so they really clamp down on innovation and technology and things that would really make legal education much cheaper. Now, now what about California? I'm, I'm told California is different because you just you just need to pass the bar and you're a lawyer uh, and and is is that true? Am I misinformed, or, well, there, or is that different? I don't know all the specificities of California's law, but I know they have a lot of law schools that are not ABA accredited. So if you go to those schools, you can sit for the California bar exam and practice in California, but you're not going to have the type of mobility you could have if you went to an ABA accredited law school because you wouldn't be able to practice anywhere else. You'd be limited yeah. to California. Yeah. Well, I just know then, that like uh, Frank Abagnale, the guy from Catch Me If You Can, he um, he uh, That's right. uh, was very famous that he ba- he was probably a genius savant, but just you know w- w- was went into the con- the con artist game instead of you know yeah. something legit. Passed but yeah, the he bar just, exam he just without going to go into law school. Yeah, he studied and he passed the bar and uh, and and became a lawyer. And and I'm I'm somebody who, as you know, I'm I'm in the Guinness Book of Records for memory. I'm you know practicing for like Mensa tests and things like that. That's actually something that appealed to me: the idea that I could pass one test and then be approved. Uh, but for someone like me who's very busy but very skilled mentally, you know, it, it, the idea of having to commit to all these years and all these regulations and all these things, yeah, definitely dissuades me from joining a profession. And that's that's the exact same thing. I'm not, it's not about me. It's about the thousands of other people who are like me that have been dissuaded as well that make a smaller group and essentially limit competition and really, really raise prices. Yeah, well, and with the bar exam in particular, the bar exam does not actually test legal skills. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be a great lawyer, you have to have all kinds of skills, negotiation skills, client-based skills. That's not just a, uh, it's not just that you can memorize a bunch of the archaic legal rules, which is kind of what the bar exam does. It tests mm-hmm. the black letter law rules and their exceptions. And most of that law, you're never going to see on a day-to-day basis if you're an attorney in private practice. And there's so many different areas of law. You can be a government attorney. Yeah. You can be a you know, business law. You can be doing family law and divorces. You can be doing immigration law. And uh, the bar exam is just not a measure of, of – of, it's not a predictor of success as an attorney. So 
Well, um, I mean, we could also go into nearly every test like that. I mean, essentially, you're, you're right. you yep. know, I, even me as the memory guy, I'll be the first to admit that a memory test is not a test of skill, uh, except except your skill of memory. Uh, yeah. You know, your ability to memorize and regurgitate, you know, uh, something like 90% of everything that you learn uh, in a test like that is forgotten within three years after. Now, I personally love the art of memory when it comes to things like learning languages and other things that are practical. I've used right. it in robotics and engineering, but what I do is I learn the skill, then I apply it and I really master it in the application. And that is the true art of learning. But you're right. I think going back to that apprenticeship style would be a far superior method and it would also create a, a much more trust in the system. Well, and to give you a concrete example, when I was in private practice, I was in Atlanta and whenever a new attorney would enter, they were reliant on the paralegals who had not been to law school because the paralegals had been in that industry for 20 plus years. They've been doing yeah. it for a long time. They knew the system. They knew how to file everything. They knew the people in the courthouse. And so the paralegals really made the firm operate and yeah. the new lawyers didn't know anything. I mean, they had yeah. all this, this knowledge about abstract concepts, but they didn't know how to be a lawyer. There was actually, yeah, it's really fascinating because I, uh, I, I was hired by a number of law firms to teach paralegals how to pass the bar in California. So that was, that was where that, that knowledge oh, yeah. base came from uh, because they just wanted to pass the bar as quickly as possible to memorize and regurgitate the stuff so they could get their piece of paper because they were the most capable laws, lawyers in the firm that were not allowed to be lawyers. It, it, it's, it's the most fascinating thing when you look into the actual accreditation of things. People think we want to live in a world where education matters but in fact if you really look, talk to the experts in education and the experts you know in in different fields like like what you're you're talking about there is a big difference between the people who pass the test and the people who are skilled and if yeah. we can you know, lo minimize that gap then we can change a lot of things in society well i agree with you and i think you're pointing to an even bigger problem which is that this is not just located in the legal profession this is hmm. this is about education writ large i mean higher education in general what is the point of college is it to prepare you for a job is it to equip, equip you with vocational skills or is it to do something else and if it is to equip you with vocational skills if it is to help you get a job hmm. is it succeeding or is it actually holding people back is it preventing yep. people from entering into the workforce and getting the skills they need to succeed and to be the best they can be in whatever chosen field they're in. Yeah, and there is also a lot of data that shows the certification programs lead to mediocrity within an industry uh, as opposed to competition, which leads to, to very, very high skill. And, and, and there's, uh, there's links to that. I'd love to have a debate uh, with somebody on the other side of that at any time because yeah. I've been in uh, courtrooms. I've seen bailiffs uh, know more about the law than or the practice than than uh, the lawyers representing clients i've seen uh yeah the paralegals you know running the show and just somebody with a, a law degree has to sign the paper and sign off on it and it's it's an absolute joke in some cases it's absolute uh a, a joke that that you need to be certified to practice law yet the practice where where in actuality this sort of uh, you know, apprenticeship in the industry, starting off as a paralegal, then, then, you know, having some years experience and getting into it would make a lot more sense, you know? Yeah. I would rather hire Abraham Lincoln who had been trained and apprenticed under, you know, successful, competent lawyers for several years and had gotten his feet wet had yeah. reviewed pleadings and all that than somebody who has learned sort of abstract principles and how to apply them to cases, but hasn't actually gone out there and practice any law hasn't actually done anything. Mm -hmm. And I'll also tell you, as an entrepreneur, I've run several businesses for the last 26 years and counting. And uh, I got to say, when it comes to contract law, I have corrected my lawyers' uh, mistakes uh, more yeah. times than I can count, and and found things they didn't find. Now I still, you know, work with a lawyer who has you know many many years' experience to make sure that they, you know, in, to their credit, they find things that I don't see. But just my experience with the law has given me something that somebody right out of law school would never have, you know? Yeah, I think that's right. I think anybody who's been through lawsuits themselves has been, been through typically more than uh, what an ordinary recent law graduate has been through. No, that's true. I haven't gone through a lawsuit yet, you know, knock on wood, but, <laughs> uh, but I have gone through a lot of contract negotiations and I have seen those contracts go awry and people 
you know, threatened suits and things like that. So, you know, knowing what to watch out for, that experience is worth a lot. Well, this has been really fascinating, Al. Thank you very much for being on the yeah, show. Thanks for having um, me. And it's really important to understand that the foundation of that, that American Bar Association really was uh, created in response to poor people getting legal assistance. Think about that. That is... Uh, the genesis of something, you know, makes a big difference. You know, there's an old Spanish saying that the, uh, as the twig is, is bent, so grows the tree. And it really explains where we are today with, with today's incredibly high prices for, for what I'd say very competent lawyers. And then, um, you know, there's, there's, that, there's that, you know, struggle at the bottom level, you know. Yeah, well, and to add to that last point, you hear a lot of complaints about lack of diversity in the legal profession, lack of access to the legal profession for uh, people that are of low, low to modest income levels. And this is all by uh, institutional design when it comes to state bar associations, American bar associations, they're actually operating the way they were designed to operate. Mm -hmm. That these effects are not just incidental, but they are um, planned. Yeah. And, and we, we talk about, you know, systemic racism and, you know, systems in place and things like we don't actually that's, look that's, at some of these systems and start right. thinking, hey, maybe there was a different system that worked better, uh, that would work better. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. I really Thanks, appreciate Dave. you. Definitely a brains behind this topic. Thank you.